We're only going to get through this energy transition by using plastics, because that's how you make things. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look in your office, if it's not made out of glass or wood, it's made out of carbon. And glass or steel, it's made out of carbon. And mostly that's polymers of some kind. And the reason polymers yeah. are out there is because they do a really good job. They're really good materials. They're highly engineered. We need to do a better job of keeping them out of the environment. That's absolutely true. But every electric vehicle is full of plastic. Every wind turbine is full of plastic. Every solar panel is full of plastic. All the stuff we need to build to get us out of this mess. We need lots of plastics. Welcome to the Energenius Podcast with Joe Patch the Fourth. I want to welcome everyone to another episode of the Inner Genius Podcast. I'm excited today. I have on Ron Epperson from uh, Intellectual Energy. He is the managing director. Uh, Ron, it's great to have you on. Thank you for making time to be with us today. Great being here, Joe. Excellent. Let's kick it off to take kind of take it from the start. Give us a little bit of background on, you know, kind of how you got to where you are. I think it's always fascinating, you know, when you look at certain people, their their career, their career path, career trajectory. Oftentimes, I think it's what not what most people think. And that's what I like about it that makes it unique. Great. Well, let me, you know, how far back to go? Um, <laughs> that's me, the question. I'm going to start with something significant. It's a long way back, but it's kind of significant to me. So um, I'm a first gen college student. So I grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. My family's been there for many, many, many generations. First gen college student. And really what influenced me to go to college, which kind of led to a lot of my career paths, um, two things. One was I was always a reader, even as a little kid. Awesome. And I love to read. And it was like, I would read everything my grade level, then I'd read everything the next grade level, then I read everything the next grade level, just nice. kept wanting to know more and more and more. Uh -huh. And I was fortunate to be going to the schools in Lynchburg, Virginia, when they were desegregated. And one of the okay. things that happened was all of my science teachers ended up coming from the old segregated African American school system. Okay. And they were all brilliant, you know, because wow. you think about that time in America in the South. Mm -hmm. If you were a highly intelligent African-American person who was educated, one of the best jobs you could have was be a school teacher. Okay. So, okay. you know, my, uh, my physics teacher, Mr. Holmes, he had three mm. master's degrees. Wow. Uh, in math, physics, and music. And he oh, was yeah, also wow. had a doctorate in divinity and was a minister. And, wow. Wow. And uh, Mrs. Campbell, who was my chemistry teacher, she's uh -huh. the one that turned me into a chemical engineer because there I really go. liked math and I really liked chemistry, but I knew that chemists had to get a PhD and I didn't want to go to school that long. I mean, right. going to college was I'm kind of the pioneer in my family anyway. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a long way to go before you're making <laughs> money. So That's she funny. said, I have chemical engineering. I said, I'd never even heard uh, of chemical engineering before Mrs. Campbell yeah. told me this. So I looked it up and said, that sounds right because it's the practical application of chemistry to real world right. problems. So uh -huh. that started me down that path. Uh, so they, they, those, those te those are two teachers that came from, you know, that fortuitous merging, you know, mm -hmm. of the desegregation of the schools in Virginia that mm -hmm. also, um, really helped me open my minds. And what I really liked about Mr. Holmes was mm -hmm. he was really hard on you to do as well as you could. If you were an A wow. student, you're getting B's. He was all over you. Wow. Wow. But if okay. you were, you know, a B student getting B's. He was supportive. I mean, he, want, he wanted people to really achieve, really achieve, mm. be the best mm. you can. You know, you can do better. You know, you right, got more. Right. Uh, and that, that was a big wow. drive. So uh. graduated from high school, went to Virginia Tech, became a chemical engineer, mm. got out, fast forward a little bit, got out of school, ended up working for Shell in Geismar, Louisiana. And oh, okay. Geismar, you know, I was like, I'd never worked in, you know, four of my jobs growing up, you know, I would I had a semi-corporate internship for one summer, but mostly it was like work at the gas station, work at the grocery store, you know, because that's what there was. Had my right. own little business when I was a little kid. Um, but uh, ended up going to work for, for Shell Chemical in Geismar, Louisiana as a process engineer. And I was fortunate to be there. Nice. I've been fortunate in a lot of my career that I've been in positions where they could have been really rote and, and repetitive and boring uh -huh. But they weren't because I was a, I, I joined this facility and we got this this particular role as process engineer in this particular unit. Uh -huh. Just as that unit was, it was brand new technology that just figured out how to make it work right. We're okay. now in the world. Now let's really grow it and make it bigger. So oh, nice. I was fortunate, you know, through several roles there to really not only have personal growth, but to really make that part of the plant more productive, make more money, solve problems you know, mm -hmm. develop new products and services for customers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, so while I was at Geismer, I, you know, I did 
process engineer, I ended up being the technical team leader of several of my peers. Nice. Uh, supply chain, we didn't call it supply chain, then we called it economics and scheduling. Supply nice. chain manager for the whole plant, oh, and wow. then operations maintenance manager for a segment of the plant. You oh, know, wow. and I was a young guy, you know, trying to earn the respect of all these old Cajun guys who were, yeah. you know, and Cajun guys will, who have been, they've seen a lot of guys like you go through there who think they're all that, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 They really help me get, stay humble and, and really earn it. It helped that I had a blue collar background, so I didn't mind picking up a hammer with them or, sure. you know, and somebody hey, carry this out there, et cetera. I didn't mind getting dirty, sweaty, whatever right. I wanted to learn. So followed that role, right ended up getting transferred to head office in Houston. Okay. Uh, in Houston, I went to a bigger supply chain role, but same business unit. So not just okay. that plant, but multiple plants, multiple customers continued to be challenged and, and engaged by lots of new product. We were doing a lot of new product launches, expanding mm -hmm. new facilities, uh -huh. et cetera. And um, I was able to, because of that, to, to, um, uh, to really scratch that itch I have for innovation and mm -hmm. the new and solving problems, et cetera. Again, it wasn't right. just the same old, how do we make the same product we were making last year, just a tiny bit cheaper, you know, right, which right. is what a lot of the chemical industry is, right? Like nothing wrong okay. with that. It just didn't really excite me personally. Right. Okay. I went through okay. that, had an opportunity to go up to shell oil company level from chemicals and be um, director of downstream planning for everything from or basically everything downstream from the oil wells. That planning oh, wow. cycle, okay. being direct okay. support to the sea level at Shell Oil Company, which is a great experience because it took me from kind of the nitty gritty plant level mm -hmm. uh, problem solving into how do we tell a story to our investors that is credible. And this was a time we weren't making as much money as we thought we should be or that we promised we would. So. Okay. You know, I got really good at understanding how to spin stuff. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's part of the business. Why, but you know, yeah. okay, these things happen. This is why we didn't make our number last quarter. Right. These right. things happen, you know, and this is what we're doing to fix it kind of stuff. Right. You know? Also, you, you can't just explain it. You have to have a plan. So exactly. that was a key learning. And then was able to roll out of that role into what we call our chemical. At that time, it was called chemicals business development. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was another great opportunity because it was, it was a business unit that existed in the white spaces of the company. So okay. if there was, we were looking to, do, how could we stand up new businesses within Shell that released 200, $250 million revenue, but they weren't something we were already doing, but they mm -hmm. may build off of an existing technology or existing customer knowledge or okay. existing feedstock advantage or whatever, but we weren't doing it. And a lot okay. of it was new stuff out of the lab. So it got oh, involved okay. a lot, and that led to being very much involved in a lot in commercialization and M&A, because we were also buying companies to integrate into those platforms as well. Okay. And then ended that time, ended my time at Shell, because one of the last things I worked on, we were monetizing it through, um, we were monetizing it all through intellectual property licensing. So I ended up building and running a licensing business in chemicals. Oh, wow. Which was okay. global in scope. So again, okay. I've done all these amazing things. Wow. Yeah. And Travel spent a lot of time. I could have voted in Frankfurt one year, I think, because we had partners there. I spent a lot of time with them. Uh -huh. um, great opportunity. Great opportunity. I learned a lot. Uh, it's really where I learned my superpower, which is how do you take something new that works in the lab and turn it into take it from something a VC would be interested in because it's disruptive and cool and you know never been done before, and turn it into something an infrastructure investor like a Shell or a uh -huh. big bank might invest in which means I'm actually going to get my money back if I put money in this. Right, That's kind right, of right. the superpower I developed at Shell was how do, you, how do you develop technology? So I'm really good at commercialization. And I really learned that in my Shell days, having Interesting. way more opportunities to do that than I probably should have ever had. <laughs> wow, wow. You must have been fairly successful at it too if they're going to keep you in it. I mean, you probably had a pretty good run at it, huh? I did, you know, and I had, it really came to a point where you know, I hit a point about 20 odd years ago where I said, okay, I've been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also, we were changing our strategy within Shell. We were going okay. more toward the commodity businesses and less toward the businesses that were doing the things I was really good at, like the innovative stuff, and customers. Yes. We were going to go more like, let's just make it the same way we did it before, only a tenth of a penny cheaper. Right. And I could do that, but it didn't really excite me. 
Yeah. Uh, at the time, yeah. though, because of my chops and in intellectual property, and that was a time when that was kind of a hot market in the consulting world, I got recruited into consulting and I ended up running Ernst & Young's IP consulting practice. Okay. So okay. Really big shift from, from yeah. uh, you it's know, chemicals, words. plants, molecules to um, really, you know, sea level sales and mm-hmm. service on IP strategy Mm -hmm. Uh, IP monetization, litigation Mm -hmm. support, all those kind of things. I went into that world and was really able to to build and lead a team for several years that we had great success in doing all those things. So great, great fun doing that. But again, did that for a number of years. And but I went to school a long time ago to do things that we called in the back in the day alternative energy. Solar right. and wind and yeah, yeah, yeah. There were there were alternatives because there were small yeah. alternatives. You know, well, about 2008 time frame is when you first started seeing the inflection point on wind and solar in a big yes. way. Yep, you know, I agree. And now this is starting to be real. And um, and I was working with there were a number of companies that wanted to hire me through EY and other other firms. You know, they couldn't afford that. You know, it's it like you needed a different kind of structure where maybe part of the pay was in equity. Etc. I was living in Arizona by this time. Said, okay. okay. Um, I started intellectual energy at that point, particularly so I could work more in this sector, really helping companies figure out how to scale up their business, how to raise money, sure. how to put their teams together, how to get to the next level. Right. Uh, okay. And so that's intellectual energy has been around since 2008. Uh, mm-hmm. Several times since I've been in intellectual energy, I've been recruited into my clients as a C-level executive. Okay. Um, Okay. One, I started on my own. I started a with a friend of mine. I started a development company for solar and geothermal in Arizona for that worked primarily with Native oh. American tribes in the desert southwest. Oh wow! Okay. And we were doing okay. projects all over New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, et cetera. Back when a ten megawatt solar project was huge. I remember those days. Yeah. yeah Seems it wasn't like that long ago. It was. It was. It was not that long ago. I agree. No, yeah. and we were out there doing those doing those feisty little yeah. one, two, five megawatt projects and making money That's off the PPAs. Yeah. But that one, that one we did found, but all the others were people brought me in. And all the way okay. up through, ended up um, ended up uh, being CEO of a water tech company that oh, okay. brought me in as a consultant. And I, my, my advice to him was, you're ready to go. You need to raise some serious money and, and go for it. I mean, you're ready yeah, to yeah. stay. You've, you've knocked off, you've got a customer, you've got the technology platform developed. It's time yes. to raise some money so you can really do this. Right. And they said, right. that sounds like great advice. Would you do that for us? Oh, wow. Uh, I thought about it for about a day. And I said, you know, yeah. that would actually be kind of cool. Oh, so wow. I went out and raised a bunch of money and we, you know, had some nice success, won some awards, mm-hmm. uh, got it to a certain point. There was a change in federal administration. So water rules got relaxed a bit. Yeah. Some of our market went evaporated, no pun intended. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at that point. <laughs> So we needed to pivot the company in a direction that didn't really fit my background to environmental services and say, you know what, the founder, I just, we basically, I gave the keys back to the founder at that point. Sure. So this is sure. not what I'm good at, or I don't, I'm not really the right person to lead this because I'd, yeah. I'd yeah. be learning. I'd be five minutes ahead of everybody at best. Right. So I don't right. like being there. So, uh, but I've been involved in a number of companies since then. Uh, mm-hmm. And you said, you know, what are you working on now? Probably the biggest thing I'm, well, my, yeah, I want to get into on, that. Yeah. Yeah, stuff you're taking ahead. on right now. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, go so ahead. So what I focus on is really the hydrogen, carbon management, and green chemistry sectors. And I do that because, you know, wind and solar are not easy, but we know how to do them. Right. You know, we have a template. There's a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of expertise out there. Mm-hmm. And people know what it takes to execute one of those projects. The finance, the people that finance those projects know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. But you get into the hard to decarbonize sectors. You start looking at things like petrochemicals and refining and steel and yeah. concrete and things like that. Yeah. Wind and solar are not going to get us there. You know, they okay. can they can work around the margins, but they're not going to decarbonize those industries. Mm-hmm. But hydrogen carbon capture and even green chemistry will decarbonize those industries. And those are areas where I'm I'm attracted there because again, I think I'm best used where we know what we want to do, but we don't know how to do it yet. We kind okay. of know what the prize is, but we got to figure out the, the road. Is that path? Yep. Um, yep. And maybe the tech works, but it works. And, you know, we're doing Graham aliquots in the lab. And, hey, we can make this thing. 
you know, and, and the techno-economic analysis says we can make it and make money, but we actually have to do all these other things to get there. Right. And that's right. where I like to work is in that okay. sense. So, and, you know, hydrogen is going to be massive. Carbon capture is going to be massive mm-hmm. and green chemistry is going to be massive. And I include sustainable aviation fuel when I talk about that, because that's how we're getting to sustainable aviation fuel is through greener forms of chemistry than what we've traditionally done. You know, yeah, I was going to ask you. Gas. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's a term I I don't hear very often. This green chemistry. What can you can you kind of kind of tease that out a little bit? You know, I'm, there'll be people that'll know what it so, means. I'm I'm a little on the up up curve there. Yeah, there's a lot in that bucket. Okay, there's a lot in that bucket. But think about I give you some examples. Uh, sure. Some companies that have been added and have had some good success. So okay. take Lonza Tech for example. Okay. So I know Jennifer Holmgren, CEO there. She's done a great job there. Lonza Tech takes CO two. Okay. captured off of point sources. I think they've been primarily using steel mills ex- as an example. Okay. They take okay. that CO2, they use bio- They use genetically modified organisms to mm. convert that CO2 into chemicals, primarily alcohols of various types. Okay. okay. And now you have a, so you're taking a waste product, CO2, and turning it right. into an article of commerce. The beauty of that, you know, and another one that's out there, that's a Houston company that's just really killing it is Solugen. And they use a combination of catalysis and um, biology to take things like high fructose corn syrup and make um, and make interesting high value chemicals out of them. Chemicals that sell them more than a dollar a pound. So more in the specialty realm. Okay. And their platform okay. allows them to make all kinds of different things off the same plant. Okay. With limited okay. modification. So interesting, interesting. this is a company very few people have heard of. They've got a $2 billion market cap and have raised $600 million. And they're, and they have, rev, they have about $200 million of revenue. So they're, they're the real deal. Wow, uh, that's impressive. Guys, that's those, impressive. Are, those, those are a couple of examples, you know, okay. taking, and then there's others. Uh, you look at sustainable aviation fuels. Some are like, some are taking alcohols and converting mm-hmm. them to um, determined fuel, basically, basically kerosene. Okay. Uh, others are taking, are making synthetic or making um, syn gas, you know, taking CO2, converting it to CO, blending mm-hmm. it with hydrogen, and then using Fisher tropes to grow all kinds of chemicals out of that. We've been doing that for over a hundred years. So we know how to do okay. that. Um, there's there's a variety of different approaches here. You know, people working at work coming from ethanol production. Mm-hmm. Some people are looking at taking ethanol plants, converting them to make um, aviation fuel. So those oh, are really? all examples okay. of green chemistry. It's really okay. a, a better way to think of it is how can I make chemicals with a lower carbon intensity? You know, using okay. It. Okay. so I'm not just taking natural gas and oil, crude oil to do that. It, it, so the, the the drive towards the the green chemistry is 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 it as much about cost or is it really about mission and initiative? Um, looking at the decarbonization in, in particular, uh, what, what's really moving the needle there for the success of some of these particular companies, uh, what would you say? Well, um, it's a couple of things. Some of it is mission-driven, absolutely. Okay. But okay. mission-driven, as we all know, those of us that have been in this sector for a long time, mission-driven will get you about that far, just a okay. little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know, to get to the, to penetrate the big market, uh, right. there's a limited number of people that'll pay a premium for that mission-driven piece. So okay. really what you're, you're looking for is how can you take something that's a normally a waste product right. that contains carbon because all chemical, most chemicals that we're talking, I'm talking organic chemicals when I say green chemistry mostly. Um, mm-hmm. So they've all got carbon in them. How can we find other sources of carbon that would normally be emitted to the atmosphere? Maybe it's biomass, maybe it's, right. uh, you know, maybe it's CO2, whatever. How can I take those products and then turn them into a, useful product. And by the way, because they're chemicals, there's already markets for these chemicals. I don't have to create a new market to, um, I don't have to create a new market to make this happen. There's already market for polyethylene, polypropylene, et cetera. If I can make that at a similar cost, yeah, be a little bit more, but probably not for long, but if I can find a way to do that with a similar cost, that's a win, you know, win for carbon intensity. Right. So right. that's what's drive. What's driving a lot of this is a lot of smart people doing a lot of clever things with primarily with CO2 and hydrogen's another green chemistry. And this is one you're probably probably a little closer to home. You hear about green ammonia. So green ammonia. Mm-hmm. a lot of people 
you know, ammonia uses a lot of hydrogen. All that hydrogen today is made out of natural gas. That's true. Yeah, methane yeah. reforming and the, and the CO2, most of it gets vented to the atmosphere. Right. So uh, if you don't, if you can make that by electrolysis using renewable energy, you now have an extremely low carbon intensity hydrogen. And now that ammonia, it's chemically the same thing. The ammonia doesn't right. care how the hydrogen was made. Uh, right. You now have a product that uh, has a very low carbon intensity and you already have a huge market for ammonia and fertilizer. That's true. Yeah, that's so a good market. It's really trying yeah. to find those ways you can drop something into an existing value chain. Uh, and you may have to start with a price premium. You know, so you may have to find someone who's mission driven or, you know, sees a marketing advantage. You see green steel is one area where sure. some of the European car companies are marketing themselves as using green steel. That's steel with carbon capture on it, for example. Exactly. Yeah. To reduce yeah. the, the foot, to reduce the carbon footprint. There's a market for that. It's not a big market, but there's a market that gets you started though. It gets you the it gets you the foot, you know, for your foot in the door, right? As 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 they say. And and but I think it's it's the collection of them that will penetrate the market. I think we've always seen that. So you get enough of them to lock arms. <clears throat> Next thing you know, you got a bit of an army. And then you'll, you know, you'll you'll get the competitive advantage in the marketplace. And that'll drive the price down. We've seen it with solar and wind, mm -hmm. et cetera. So you do get those those economies of scales uh to, to your advantage. Um yeah, that's really interesting. I, I we we work with a, a a client that does green hydrogen, kind of a, a waste to a waste to hydrogen conversion, and yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's really interesting. There's there's a lot of interesting uh, ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're right. A lot of smart people are taking on these problems, which is exciting. I, I think the bigger the challenge, the, the the bigger the the rush, the bigger the win, the bigger the curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think we're seeing that that play out a lot. And I think that the idea of renewable energy, which is once called alternative energy, it, is now mainstream. It, it, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's absolutely part of the energy mix that we live with in this country. Um, we've got a lot to work on. We've talked about that on other podcasts. There's, there's so much to be done. I think that's one of the exciting things about our space mm -hmm. is that if you, if you look at this on a continuum, there's so many places to insert yourself. Right. that um, I think are incredibly valuable and are, are part of that, that chain that, you know, when you hit the light switch, the light goes on um, as That's opposed to, you know, you better go find some candles. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, no, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great space to be. And, and I also think too, you know, even for some of the younger generation, I mean, that's something that's on my mind a lot, I guess, as you get older, you, you think about this and it's, so many of these the, these ideas and these technologies are, are are so new that if you if you insert yourself in let's call it now in five years from now you're you're becoming one of the the leaders in the space if, exactly. if you've really kind of doubled down and really focused this is not one of those you mentioned kind of shell and if you're there 25 30 years and you you know you kind of direct what goes on at the conference room table you got you got some clout but I think in some of the things that you're talking about and some of the other renewable energies. The market is really, really ripe. If you want to get in and uh, and be a part of of this initiative that uh, affects everybody, uh, I think there's some great runways to to being uh, in leadership and to be in some strategy positions to come up with some creative solutions uh, and to have people really kind of weigh on you. You know, what mm -hmm. do you think, Ron? How should we go after this? I mean, it feels good every now and then. So, and you know, I talk to a lot of young folks. You know, ask uh -huh. for career advice, and I go, yep. well, you know, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a chemist. Why should I?" you know, do something in chemistry or hydrogen or whatever, right. like, well, you know, but not everybody at Apple is a coder either. I mean, that's right. You know, you need people that can figure out, you know, how do we, how do we market these products? How do we raise money? You know, how do we, um, how do we manage the workforce? You know, all these, all these skills that are highly important and no company can operate without them and be right. successful right. Uh, right. that are not, you know, sure, we need a lot of great engineers and we need a lot of great scientists, but that's not all we need. You know, we need a lot of other things. You know, I tell, I tell kids now, you know, you know, if you don't want to go to college, go be an electrician. Oh, oh because I've had that chat. Yep. We're going to be short 650,000 electricians this decade, you know, in the next few years, yep. because we're electrifying everything that will hold still. That's and, right. And that's the right. average electrician is probably about 50 years old. That's but, right. you know, and if you're, and I'll think about electrician. I mean, it's a technical skill, but you can learn it and make money while you learn it. So no debt, you're not right. taking on any college debt. Yeah. 
And you can either work for somebody else or you can, you know, buy a truck and put a sign on it and you're got your own business. You know, it's, uh, yes, you can, you can we're, we're going to need that skill and it's, uh, it's a great job. Uh, it's going to pay really well. You can't outsource it. <laughs> AI nope. is not going to do it. <laughs> nope. Yep. 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 Nope. So no, I, yeah, I agree. I agree. So it's, but in the college, I mean, but I think, you know, climate change is the existential threat right now. It is, it is the issue. Mm-hmm. Everything mm-hmm. else pales around. You think about border things. Okay. You know, why do we have a lot? Why did we have a lot of people coming to our border in recent years? Because of a giant drought in Central America and all the farms failing. And mm-hmm. people were starving. Why mm-hmm. was there a Syrian civil war? A giant drought in Syria mm-hmm. that caused yeah. huge population pressures. I mean, it's already happening. You know, yeah. all these things, you know, we should care about the border and not about the climate. It's all the same thing. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know, we're just hitting the, like, the very tip of the iceberg of the problems right now, too. So we've got to solve these problems. So, you know, if you're smart, and this, these industries are just getting started and they're already huge. That's true. They're, they're, they're just getting started. Yeah. And there's so many that are coming up every day. I mean, there's so yeah. much opportunity here. And I agree with your, your trades comments as well. I, mm-hmm. It's a conversation I, I've had with some people offline as well. I, mm-hmm. There's a massive shortage. And to your, you know, the electricians in particular, particularly in the space that we're in, are, are in great demand. Um, they're retiring more than, than they're minting. And, you know, that, 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 that curve is going to go upside down. I, I think to some extent it's already there today. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a client. This is very interesting. They're being a, a number of large electrical generation projects. Mm-hmm. And this wasn't the case back in, you know, 08, 09, 2010. You know, you put it out for bid to any number of electrical contractors that could handle something utility scale. As you get bigger, it, you know, the, the kind of the, the pot size decreases a bit. But all that to say, you, you would always get back, you know, their proposals, right? That, that request for quote, they'd always come back and say, here's my bid. These are the qualifications, exceptions, et cetera. So, you know, you, you meter it out amongst three, four or five, how many bids you're taking. What I'm seeing now, it's kind of scary, is that they're, they're not always responding or they're flat out not interested. Yeah, they and it's like one bid or no bid. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and it's like, so now you're sitting there, you've done all of your, 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 you know, your, your real estate work, right. You've, you've, you've worked with the utilities, try to get a, a PPA in place. You've done all the financial modeling that you need to do. You've worked with the engineering team. You've done like California, you've done the SQL analysis. You got your environmental teed up, right. You're working with your interconnection. I mean, you got all the pieces of the puzzle. You're, you're ready to go. I mean, this is, we're good. You don't have any, you don't have an electrical contractor. <laughs> that's a problem. I mean, to your problem. point, that is a massive problem. And it's yeah. really sad too, because you could be sitting on a great project with, you know, with a great interconnection. Uh, I mean, there, there's room on the line, minimal upgrades, the, the need is there. Uh, the RTO is excited that you're involved. The utility can't wait to buy the power. I mean, it's, it, let's just say it's a good, clean project and you, you just can't go anywhere. And as we know, the demand curve is, is running away from us. Oh yeah. I mean, we're, and so it's it's sad. It's like, well, I desperately need what you have, and I can't get it. And the whole time, you know, I'm losing. I'm losing time. I'm, you know, we're yeah. we're losing pace. And it's and I think to your point though, Ron, you bring up a good point. This is something that affects everybody. I think mm-hmm. it's easy when you get into certain businesses. Well, I really I don't care, or it doesn't matter. It doesn't because it doesn't affect me. But the the world we're in on the power side. It just affects everybody. I mean, oh. if, again, if, unless you want to go back to candles, you like the fact that, you know, you got power. And that's another thing people don't get. Like if you go to your switch, I'm looking at the light switch. If you go to the switch and it, you flip it, it doesn't come on. What is that? Three, really four, five, five years to get that problem fixed. Yeah. It's well, not, just, you know, it's, you know it's just bad. here in Texas where I live, you know, um, yep. I think it was last week, ERCOT put out, you know, their CEO was speaking to the P- PUC. Okay. And, you know, the, the peak last summer was like 85, 86 gigawatts. Okay. And they're expecting by 2030, another 63, 64 gigawatts on our cut. Really? Yeah. Really? And it's coming and it's coming from all over, you know, it's, it's EVs, it's manufacturing, EVs. the reshoring of manufacturing, right. it's data centers, it's crypto miners, it's population growth. By the way, one of the biggest chunks of that is yes. the electrification of the Permian Basin. So basically, instead of flaring gas or 
using gas to um, to operate equipment. You know, there's a lot of, you know, in the oil field, a whole lot of equipment is historically just run on vent gas, you know, run your compressor or whatever on that. Yep. It yep. may not be very efficient. There's like 20 of that 60 some odd gigawatts is permeant. Are you serious? Small really? oil. Wow. <laughs> I mean, the it's irony. crazy how much the demand's yeah. going to grow. And then you, and you look at the interconnect queue and 95% of the internet interconnect queue in Texas for the next six, next till 2030 is renewables and batteries. 95% of the queue, huh? Is, is renewables or batteries. And you can call, some people don't like to call battery. The battery guys don't really like to call batteries renewables because it keeps them below the, below the fight a little bit, mm-hmm. but it's not gas. I mean, 5% is natural gas. That's wow. it. And that wow. 5%, by the way, is not enough to fill that 64 gigawatt hole. It's enough. How to would fill you put it in perspective? <laughs> yeah. And how would you put that in perspective, Ron, to the layman? If you're 64 um, gigawatts, like it, for someone to get their mind around how much power that really is, it's a giant amount of power. It's a giant amount of power. Yeah. It's, it's hard to even grasp that. Uh, in numbers, I don't know what what country you could think of that takes sixty four gigawatts, and just not in my head. Right, um, right, right, right. But I mean, it's just let's just put it this way: a big natural gas power plant is going to be what a gigawatt, a gigawatt and a half, maybe. Yeah, a yeah. big one combined big cycle. One. Guess what? They're not building combined cycle plants in Texas. They're building no. peakers. We're building yeah. peaker plants and solar and batteries. That's what we're building. That's right. That's, That's right. how we're going to fill that sixty four gigawatt hole. Wow. Well, I mean, that, you said it was how much again? You said it was 86, 85, 8,600? Uh, la- last year's peak was 86 gigawatts, 85, 86. So we're rough, okay, so we're roughly 7, 8% then is, is the growth projection. Yeah, and, and it's going to go up in six years, it's going to go up another 60. So the total is going to be like closer to 150. That's just amazing. I mean, and that that's, is... That's not like... And the thing is, that's based on LOIs that's a, people have signed to take power off the grid. Yeah. <laughs> that's not Gosh, made man. up numbers. That's like hard, you know, that's like hard pieces of paper that people have, that CEOs have signed to say, I wow. need two gigawatts for this factory. I need whatever for that. Gosh. And that's, it, you know, and that oh, hydrogen's a, part of that, of course. Green hydrogen is yeah. a big piece of that. Sure. And right now, you know, the green hydrogen business barely exists in the U.S., no, that's true. What do you, let's talk about that for a quick second. What do you see as a trajectory for green hydrogen? What, you, what are your thoughts there? I want to get your get your take on what, okay, what do you I'm see? Stay away what, from 45V because one, it's everybody has an opinion. And I know people that are on both sides of the issue who are friends, and I'm not going to offend either one of them, but yeah. let's set 45V apart for a minute. So I think what's going to happen with hydrogen is mm-hmm. I think the biggest problem green hydrogen has is not the tax credits. It's the offtake because a lot of people, there is not a huge market right now that can take giant electrolysis plants, green hydrogen. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't exist right. Even with the, even if they got the full tax credit, right. they did the full three pillars, had solar behind the meter, however they got there. There's just not a market there that can buy that green hydrogen. Just not. Um, so, um, but there is a market that can buy small chunks of it, like for transportation fuels, okay. like for railroads, like for uh, decarbonization of ports to drive, you know, shipping that operates within the port. I mean, most most vessels that are in ports, they start and stop their day at the same dock. They're not going okay. across the ocean. That's a great right. application for hydrogen. You got a diesel electric tugboat. Why not a hydrogen fuel cell electric tugboat? That's easy. Okay. That's an easy okay. conversion. Yeah, it's okay. money. We know how to do it. Okay. Railroads the same way. Diesel electric locomotive. I mean, already this this spring, somebody ran a, a fuel cell uh, uh, electric locomotive for three thousand kilometers. Oh wow! Great. Without refueling. Now, okay, it was in a big loop. One going up and down hills, but still three thousand sure. kilometers. That's a pretty good range. No, that's good. That's good. You got yeah. people building ships in Europe. Uh, they, they go like from Rotterdam to Stockholm carrying shipping containers. Those are being built hydrogen fuel cell electric. Okay. Okay. Because you can do hydrogen on either end. So I think transportation is going to work. So that kind of argues for smaller electrolyzers, more dispersed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're also, 
you know, in a case like diesel fuel, some of those applications are in the money pretty easily with okay. the, the tax credit. So I think what Plug Power has been doing, you know, with, yep. you know, I think their model scaled up a little bit is kind of what we're going to see happen first, more so than the big gigawatt electrolyzers. And okay. it's, a lot of those guys are struggling with off takers. I mean, and I've had guys call me, you know, uh -huh. coming from the green electron side, wanting to get into the green molecule side. Uh -huh. You know, first thing is like, oh, yeah, uh -huh. we think we can use our expertise. What's an air permit? Uh -huh. Like, uh, yeah, you really don't understand this business, do you? <laughs> We're going to make green ammonia. Who's your customer? Oh, we'll just sell it on the spot market. No, you won't. <laughs> no, no. It'll work no. that way. Yeah, you, exactly. you don't want to, you're not going to get finance doing that. That's for sure. Right. So right. Um, there's a lot of, there's some, 90, there's some really smart people doing it. I don't want to dismiss that, but there are definitely people sure. that are still early stages in figuring this out. But what I do think is going to happen is blue hydrogen is going to jump in a big way. Because, really? Okay. Uh, yeah, because people just take the 45Q credits. Okay. You, know, you look at SMRs are based, SMRs with carbon capture are basically in the money now with 45Q. Okay. I think the reason we haven't done more is people were waiting to see what 45V did. But if okay. 45V really is three pillars, et cetera, you know, you're, let's just put carbon capture on our SMRs where that makes sense, you know, because of the geology. But the Gulf okay. Coast, where most of the SMRs are, and Gulf Coast has the geology. So we'll, I think right. we'll see a lot of that. And that'll take care of a lot of the guys like refining, et cetera. The, and that'll allow the, the gigawatt scale green hydrogen business to kind of catch up a little bit okay. and grow into those larger end uses that are new end uses. I mean, everybody's chasing ammonia because it's a big right. end use for hydrogen right now. Everybody's chasing oil refining because it's a big end use that exists right now. Right. Okay. Once you saturate those, what are you going to do? And you'll say, yes. you will saturate those pretty quick. Even okay. though the big markets will saturate them. Well, we need steel, we need cement, we need you know, other commodities to start using hydrogen. We need to figure out, do we want to do e-methanol for ocean shipping? Um, those kind of things. What are we going to do with sustainable aviation fuel? How much hydrogen will that take? Uh, mm -hmm. Those kind of things. So those, those are markets that are either don't exist or are really tiny right now. Okay. So I think the blue hydrogen will bridge us. I mean, the, the intent of blue is always to bridge to green. Okay. Uh, well, that's interesting. There is a big argument among the, um, and there's a big argument among folks in um, uh, in the environmental sector about well, the blue hydrogen really is, is it's worse than the gray hydrogen. It can't be because you're venting it, but uh, yeah. it's really is that really how we use our money? But if it's you know it's probably mostly going to be you can't take carbon capture credits and hydrogen credits together on the same project anyway. Mm -hmm. So the hydrogen the 45V credits that could go to blue hydrogen people will probably look at it, the 45Q credit will be bigger, they'll go that way. And it's okay. better understood, is you can monetize it today. People mm -hmm. are buying those credits right and left already. Okay. So I think okay. that's what we're gonna see happen in hydrogen. Um, okay. I've had some arguments with people about that, so it's at least a 50% chance I'm wrong, but <laughs> I see it developing that way just because I don't, I see a lot of people wanting to go from tiny to gigawatt scale without an intermediate step. And I think technologically you can do that, but there's no business to hold it, to back it up. On the back Practically. End. Yeah. That's, that doesn't I just work. I think really. there's nobody to suck up yeah. all that unless they could do, I mean, there's two competing projects down in Corpus Christi right now, both of which okay. want to sell green hydrogen to the refineries in Corpus Christi. Okay. What are they? Which, which, saying we're on pause until 45 V gets figured out and it won't go forward and it cannot go forward. If, um, uh, we have the three pillars. We just can't make it work. The other one says, we're fine with the three pillars. Who's right? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, These are both really smart people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. So why yeah. is one of them say, absolutely got to have it. And the other one's like, no, we're good. We're fine the way it is. Yeah, kind of kind of make it work. Um, yeah. Are they about the same point in the process as far as construction and, and uh, completion? ish you know yeah you know, they're no, they're not exactly the same but they're not that far apart are they similar I mean, they sizes sites, they got their they, they got their project figured out they just don't they haven't started turning shovels okay okay are, do you know if they're the same size project are they roughly the, the same order roughly, of magnitude you know they're they're big okay okay it'd be, well, it'd be interesting to see where it goes i mean i i think hydrogen gosh i you know what over the next 10 20 years i, I it's going to explode 
I mean, I Hopefully think it's come a long ways in the last couple of years. Hopefully not will explode. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah. I'm an old process <laughs> safety guy. Hydrogen does scare me a little bit about hydrogen, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we yeah, safe, safe work culture for sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. What are some of the other projects? I and mean, what's kind of some of the stuff you're doing right now? You know, what, what so there's one thing play? I want to talk about that's kind of cool. Yeah. And it illustrates, you know, Secretary Granholm's point from DOE that, you know, mm-hmm. we have all the technologies we need. We need to deploy, deploy, deploy. Okay. She, that's her mantra. I mean, my notebook okay. I'm using to take notes for this call is from Deploy 23. You probably can't see that on the camera from the Deploy yeah. 23 conference last year in DC. <laughs> okay. Okay. But um, so I am working with a team that is developing the world's first zero carbon emission world scale polyethylene polypropylene plant. Okay. By world scale, okay. I mean millions of tons a year of polyethylene okay. polypropylene using okay. all off the shelf technologies. Okay. Just being wow. lashed together in a way that's never been done before. Oh, wow. wow. All things that have been practiced at scale. Okay. And interesting. And it's a multi billion, it's a huge project. It's a multi billion dollar project. Okay. But, okay. Um, like the concept is, though, to, you know, the emissions from, a, from an ethylene and polyolefin complex really come from two places. Okay. Uh, one, the ethylene cracking furnaces, which are typically natural gas fired, and then they vent to the atmosphere, CO2. Okay. But the bigger one is the cogen plant that generates the electricity and provides the steam you need to do everything. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> combination of renewable, very s- stacking renewable power, as well as um, using carbon capture and sequestration. Okay we can reduce the carbon footprint by 95%. Wow, that's impressive. I mean, that, that's huge. It that's does huge. add cost to the plant, but it adds a cost of about 5 or 6% to the t- total installed cost. 5% to the TIC, huh? Yeah, which okay. is unusual for a lot of carbon capture plants because most carbon capture deals are, they're totally dependent on the tax credit. With this project, the tax credit more than pays for the extra capital. Oh, wow, okay. So we actually will have better economics than a conventional yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. And we've got all the output pre-sold for 15 years. Okay. Got a, got a purchaser. It's already signed. I'm buying it all. We got a we got a price that collars. It's tied to ethane out of the Permian. The irony of this is the feedstock okay. is ethane out of the Permian Basin. Okay. Which <laughs> is being generated from all the oil production. It's a byproduct right. of the crude oil production in the Permian. But we'll take that and crack it into ethylene, turn some of that into to propylene, and then take the ethylene and propylene and make polymers out of them. Okay, okay. And sell them wow. to the, and here's the dirty little secret about this whole thing. You know, a lot of people are, have become very anti-plastic, you know, and that's a whole nother, we could have a whole nother yeah. hour conversation about that. <laughs> but, you know, plastics, we're only gonna get through this energy transition by using plastics, because that's how you make things. I mean, if you look in your office, if it's not made out of glass or wood, it's made out of carbon. And glass or steel, it's made out of carbon. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. and mostly that's polymers of some kind. And the reason polymers yeah. are out there is because they do a really good job. They're really good materials. Yeah. yeah. They're highly engineered. We need to do a better job of keeping them out of the environment. That's absolutely true. But, right. uh, but every electric vehicle... Is full of is full of plastic. Every you know, Absolutely. every wind turbine is full of plastic. Every solar panel is full of plastic. All the stuff we need to build to get us out of this mess, we need mm-hmm. lots of plastics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty ubiquitous. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I had someone on the podcast, and they yeah. um, they've kind of come up with a a fairly ingenious way of of um, capturing heat with 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 the process that they that they have capturing and storing heat and using it for basically process heat mm-hmm. but to his point you know look at everything around you it it required heat to get done kind of to mm-hmm. your point it's mm-hmm. without heat uh you're pretty much sitting in an empty room uh on the ground and yeah. so that's mm-hmm. your i mean it, it's it's so everywhere uh when you look at when you get the ethylene it, that's a byproduct so it, are you able to get that at a at a discounted price, it's always great when you can take someone's waste stream, if you will, and either you know get it for nothing or you get a pay to take it and then use it in the process as a part of something that you're building to sell. 
Is that part of the the economic model at a fifty thousand foot view? Yeah, if you look at the if you look at the petrochemical industry globally, uh, it's largely built off of cheap ethane, and ethane is produced with methane, natural gas, okay. and it typically it has two uses. You okay. can burn it as a fuel, or you can make chemicals out of it. That's really the only two okay. things you can do with ethane. Um, okay. And it's not like propane, where you can do all kinds of other. You know, you have interesting because it's more of a liquid. It's more fuel opportunities, but ethane's okay. a gas, okay. and just so happens the Permian Basin, you get a lot of natural gas, whether you want it or not. You get a lot okay. of natural gas production. That natural gas is very wet, as in it has a lot of ethane, propane, butane in it, which needs okay. to be separated out. And then the butane and propane, they have other uses, but the ethane, it's either I'm either going to turn it into chemicals or okay. I'm going to back blend it into natural gas. And okay. so that always sets the floor on its price. It's waste, you know, it's lower value is always heating value, the burning burner tip value. Okay. Um, the upper value is the chemical value. And if you look at the places in the world okay. that are most advantaged to make chemicals, uh, there's two places in the world that are highly advantaged to make chemicals now. The Persian Gulf, because of they have a lot of natural gas okay. that comes off that of all sense. the wells there. And the Permian yeah. Basin, because they have a lot of natural gas that comes off the wells there. Wow. And the rest wow. of so we are the US is probably the next, we're close to the lowest cost producer. We can't say we're the lowest because you know they have no no reason to burn natural gas in in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No reason to burn it. So they can flare it there. We don't want them to do that, but that's that's their alternative. Yeah, value. That's the path. Yeah. Their alternative value is burn it, is flare it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ours is at least we can burn it in a pipe. We can put it in a pipeline and burn it to do something useful. Right. Uh, right. So we're the second cheapest place in the world. And that's what's driven yeah. the first wave of reshoring of American manufacturing happened when people realized the Permian and the Eagleford and uh, Marcellus and Bakken all were producing a whole lot of natural gas that had a lot of natural gas liquids mm -hmm. which you could use for other stuff. Okay. And wow. so the chemical industry in the U.S. had a big boom in the 70s, 80s, and then really was dormant. I mean, they ran the plants that existed, but nothing new got built until the late 2000s because of Permian Basin kicking in. Wow. Has so, it, it only been around a little while, the, the, the Permian Basin kicking in? I mean, just is it, is it fa fairly new-ish? Uh, from, well, from the fracking revolution. you know, when I got you. There you go. Yeah, from the fracking of the formations. I mean, Permian has been a producing oil field since at least the 1930s. Uh, but it had declined. They, it's funny, I've, I've been in the industry long enough to have seen Permian decline quite a lot and people get out of the Permian and then fracking took over and it became, you know, like a huge problem. I mean, this is the thing. United States is producing more oil every day than any country ever has in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. We produce more oil than Saudi Arabia does. We produce more oil than Russia does. I heard that the other day from somebody and I, I, it caught me off guard. I was like, no, 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 come on, Saudi. You don't think of it that we're producing twice as much oil as we did about 15 years ago as wow. a country. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And wow. It's almost in its, you know, it's, it's these new provinces where there have a lot of shale that can be fracked to produce okay. this. I mean, it's, it wow. has helped create a lot of energy independence for the United States. Okay. Okay. Wow. So yeah, that's, I just, a, that's I would, just a thing that a lot of people don't, I'm in the industry and sometimes it doesn't, it dawns on me. Like I remember yeah. when the U S was producing like six or 7 million barrels a day. Now it's like 13, 14. <laughs> wow. A day, a day, the largest producer of oil in the world, in the world, in the history of the world, more than Saudi Arabia has ever produced. In wow. total. Now maybe if wow. they opened all the pipes, maybe they could beat us, but yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't want to do that because they'd kill the price. But uh, well, they, they have a vested interest in the price staying at a certain yeah, price they, point. they want the volume, but they also they want market share, but they also want the price to stay up. Yes, they um, do. Yeah, yeah. No, that's for but, sure. You know, that's and that's yeah. enabled a lot of things It enabled reshoring of the chemical manufacturing because of the low cost feedstocks. Uh -huh. um, there's been well over one hundred billion dollars invested in the petrochemical industry, all by the private sector in the last decade or so. And a lot of wow. that offshore money. It is. Okay. Uh, that was foreign direct investment taking advantage of the low cost feedstocks in the United States. Wow. Wow. So, wow. and you know, we, let's do the same thing with hydrogen. Let's do the same thing with, you know, we should be the, you know, Texas and Louisiana should be the Saudi Arabia of carbon capture because we got mm -hmm. the geology. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's a good point. I mean, you make a compelling case for it. I mean, certainly, you know, along the Gulf Coast right there, um, it's it's a it's a gold mine of opportunity for carbon capture. Mm-hmm. I think you're you're spot on there. Also, I mean, it sounds like from what you're saying too, what a great opportunity. There should be some hydrogen opportunities there as well. Oh yeah. I mean, in well, in, a, in a really big way. Well, Texas already produces the vast majority of the United States hydrogen, and okay. consumes it too, and mostly in refineries. That's the biggest okay. thing, and ammonia plants and things like that. But right. I mean, there's a hydro, there's a hydrogen pipeline that's exists since the 1980s that goes from Corpus Christi to Mobile, Alabama. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, it's been there for since the 80s when I was right. working on SMRs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, we were tying into that. Uh, so uh, it was, and it was all developed by private sector. Do you, do you see? Um, that's the question, right? How do you move around the hydrogen? That's that's always been one of the tricky things I've I've talked to people about. I, I mean, what do you see? Do you do you see it something that um, is all going to be moved through pipelines, or do you see it being essentially bottled up and and um, and moved OTR, or do you, you got to use it site specific? Uh, I mean, that's one of the questions. You you can produce it, but how do you distribute it? The, it's the distribution that I think runs into yeah. some problems as well. Yeah, and there's a big cost between pipeline and truck, for example, two trailers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, big cost difference. I think I think it's gonna we're gonna end up with kind of barbells with a little okay. bit in between. One okay. barbell is gonna be pipeline, you know, yep. for big users, um, and the other barbell is gonna be I'm gonna build a I'm gonna build a, a facility on your site to provide mm-hmm. you with what you need for your use. So hydrogen right. is a service. I'm not going to say oh, interesting. I'm going to sell you the service of having hydrogen. It's okay. like power models. What, what are plugs doing now? You know, okay. they're building small okay. electrolyzers for Amazon and Walmart for their warehouses that use plug power forklifts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you're going to see that in between. There's going to be some people are going to need trucks. So okay. we're going to see some, we're going to see trucks moving around. Um, but trucks are expensive. It's, you don't want to move it very far. Uh, and um so I would I would leave it there at this point. You know, it, um, how difficult is it to store hydrogen? You know, that's another thing that I've I've talked to people about, and it seems like that's 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 harder than than most people think it is. It's so, I mean, it'll be periodic table one, right? I mean, it's yeah. how, how do you is that is that a challenge? Do you think as far as storage is concerned, or you know, it is a challenge at large volumes. I okay. mean, traditional way you store hydrogen is you compress it. Right to a very high pressure, you put it okay. in some kind of vessel that can yep. hold that pressure. So that's pressure how you vessel, put yep. a whole lot in a small space. Okay. Uh, there are projects, you know, there's there's a DOE loan program office funded project in Salt Lake City. Okay. That, and I don't know who the sponsor is. I know Mitsubishi is involved in it and okay. some others. I think Chevron is also where mm. they are going to use solar, excess solar during the summer months. Okay to run electrolyzers, to gener- make hydrogen, store okay. the hydrogen in underground caverns. Uh, okay. And then in the winter, when the days are shorter, pull that hydrogen out of the cavern and blend it into natural gas and run it through turbines, through gas turbines. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's basically a seasonal battery. Think about it. It's a yeah. long duration yeah, battery, except I'm storing summer electrons and converting them into winter electrons using hydrogen as the carrier. As the carrier, store, yeah. I mean, there are geological formations that will store hydrogen effectively. Really? Uh, I didn't know that. All those, yeah. you can do that. Okay. Um, you know, most people that are on pipelines don't actually have storage. They just take, tap off the pipeline. You know, there's production. That that for, that 400 odd mile pipeline, I was that pipeline from Corpus to Mobile, I was telling you about. Right. You know, there are multiple nodes producing hydrogen into that network mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and multiple modes taking hydrogen out of that network. And okay. that keeps it balanced. Yeah, you know, You're unlikely that enough nodes are going to go down that you're going to really affect the mass balance that much, unless you have like a f- hurricane or a freeze or something. Yeah. A hurricane, you're going to shut down anyway because you want, you want the damage. You know, right, right. Generally speaking, that's how... So those big networks like that, they kind of have their own buffer in them. The, the more interesting situation is going to be when you're dealing with I mean, even these, the plug power model where you have a, you know, a smaller electrolyzer, you're still going to have some kind of buffer there right? You know, to cover how you're running the electrolyzer and what the demand is and all that. Mm-hmm. 
but it's not necessarily going to be a huge buffer. Okay. So most, so most of it really, I mean, we well, talked about the pipeline. I mean, you're using it kind of in real time, so to speak. It's, yeah. it's not meant to be storage per se. It really is part of the process. Um, yeah. Who, it's the same who man- as if you're producing it. Okay. And who manages that? Is it, is it a joint joint operation or is it? I don't know. Who's that Air products built most of it. Air products. Um, I know they're, they're yeah. the biggest, I don't think they own all of it, but you know, you know, when you get into these large commodity businesses, there's a lot of cooperation that has to happen to make yeah. the industry work. Yeah. You know, I understand. The old phrase they used to use back in the early two thousands, coopetition, you know, coopetition. Yeah. It's yeah. not unusual to see, you know, okay, we're competitors, but because it's in our mutual benefit that this, this logistics network work well, we're going to play nice with each other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You know, it's interesting you say that coopetition. I think that's something I, one of my podcasts I shot just, just recently was the, the gentleman was talking about that, that same kind of concept mm-hmm. was how you're starting to see utilities, for example, work, work more closely with customers, uh, particularly on the battery side. If you mm-hmm. can take a little more battery, then we could get a piece of that battery and we could help with uh, maybe fast tracking the interconnection, but we would want to siphon off part of the battery to help with with the load, especially in peak situations, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So you're you're seeing more cooperation for the benefit of everybody because before it was always kind of one way. You could get in mm-hmm. line, and when I get to you, then be yeah. ready, or I'll skip right over you. And it's like, yeah, exactly. but that doesn't really solve the nation's problem uh, when it comes to energy. Yeah, and if you look, you think about what's good for the customer. You know, some level of coopetition is good for the customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it also starts to show maturity in the industry. You know, if you look at um, yeah. you look at many, you know, the traditional energy sector, big coal-fired power plants, very few of those are wholly owned by one person. They're mostly mm-hmm. consortia. You know, there'll be four people that own a piece of it. And, you know, that's because they each have a need. And by getting together, they get better unit economics for each other, for the, for the yep. whole. And, right. Utilities are great because, you know, they generally, because of their territories, they generally don't compete with each other directly, but they have a, they have a vested interest in the grid being stable. They have a vested interest in there being enough generation for everyone. Yes. So they support all, you know, so, so they get that, you know, if you come from the tech world, it's all, it's a little more of like, how can I knife this guy, you know, (laughs) market share. And, oh, you know, and that, you know, okay, if we're talking about a piece of software that's not mission critical, okay, it doesn't really bother me too much. But you're talking yeah. about running the energy, the you're, you can't run the nation's energy system off a bunch of systems that can't talk to each other and optimize yes. across each other. That's right. You just can't do that. And then by systems, I mean that, you know, go down to the, you know, go down to the SCADA level if you have to, or SCADA, go up yep. to the corporate level, you have to have some degree of cooperation and some rules of the road. I mean, yes. we don't all get out. I mean, I mean, I live close to I-35, so maybe this isn't a good example. We don't go out and go Mad Max every day when we get on the freeway. Well, in Texas, we kind of do. But <laughs> we have rules that we follow. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Generally that. to everyone's benefit that we follow the rules. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. No, I I, I agree. I agree. Um, it's, and, and to your point, the, I like the comment you said about maturity. It, it's the, the, the mature nature of if we if we come together, work intelligently, we'll 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 overcome the problem. But if we mm-hmm. st- decide to stay siloed and isolate each other, um, then I, a, as a whole, everybody everybody's going to suffer. There's no one that can really dodge that, and so I think that's what makes it kind of compelling. And, and, and let's face it, electricity is a commodity. Yeah. Uh, fuel is a commodity. Mm-hmm. Uh, hydrogen is going to be a commodity. Uh, most of these chemicals are going to make by green chemicals are largely commodities. Okay. The end customer is not really going to care that much who made it and how they made it, whether they used the this this newest approach or not. I mean, you've got to do what takes care of the customer. The customer wants the functionality that they're buying. Yes. When they first started electrifying cities, they didn't sell you electricity; they sold you lighting, mm-hmm. and to the point where they would come and install the lights, and they would change your light bulbs for you. Mm -hmm. It's your house because (laughs) you didn't buy electricity. You bought light. You bought the ability to sit and read the newspaper after it was dark. Yes. Uh, Yes. And so it's kind of, you know, so most people, yeah, we use electricity, but we buy the convenience of lighting and all that other stuff. 
Right. It's desperately right. trying to call me, but they can wait. Um, okay. Uh, I know who it is and they can wait. That's all good. That's good. Um, so I think, you know, if you look at that, I think the industry just has to, will reach a level of maturity. And, and the other thing too is there's so much business out there, Joe. I yeah. mean, yeah, we compete, but there is so much business out there. I mean, there's trillions of dollars of business out there and we're just starting to get yeah. decent penetration in it. And yeah. there's, there's plenty of business for everybody. I agree. It really is. And everybody's yeah. technology or solution is not going to be for every customer either. Just oh, not. so true. So true. So, yeah. I mean, there's plenty yeah. of niches there. And, and I like to always use this quote from, you know, Jigger Shaw, right? From Loan Program Office at DOE. Okay. 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 He's, uh, well, he runs a loan program office at DOE, but he also, his claim to fame is he started two multi billion dollar renewable energy companies. And he's a finance guy. He's not an engineer. He's not a scientist. He's a finance, finance guy. guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he said this many years ago, and I still quote it. Climate change is the largest wealth creation opportunity in human history. Wow. Wow. Because we're taking everything we do that's based on fossil fuels and we're converting it to not being fossil fuels. There's right. a lot of money to be made there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I mean, it, it, this, 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 this niche is, is, is ripe, is ripe with opportunity. It really yeah. is. And it's interesting you talk about the finance background. I mean, I, you mentioned earlier, you don't have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a chemist. Um, you, you brought up the Apple example, uh, you know, not everybody's a coder or a tech guy and yeah, you, you need all parts. You need mm -hmm. every part of the business for the business to be successful. I mean, if Absolutely. you could have the greatest finance guy, you could have the greatest tech guy, you don't know how to market and guess what? No one knows about you. No one ever buys your product. Right. No, I mean, no. you manage the money wrong, you, you lose money, you go out of business. Right. And I think it's, it scares a lot of people from the industry. And I think a lot of people also get scared from the industry because, you know, it seems it's kind of like the stigma against the trades or manufacturing and all that. It's, it seems kind of dirty. You know, we've mm -hmm. had a, several generations now we've told people go to college, get a white yep. collar job, work in an office. That's the pinnacle of, of success. Yeah. That's you right. Know, yep. uh, yes. The average millionaire drives an F-150 pickup truck and probably owns his own business. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not too far off the mark, actually. I yeah, think I agree. Book, a number of years ago, they talked about, you know, the millionaire next door. Millionaire next door. Survey. And one of the things was what did the average... What it was the number one vehicle millionaires drove F one fifty. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing when you think about it. Not not it's Lamborghini. Probably a contractor. <laughs> yeah, pro probably a contractor with his, you know, with a with a small crew, yeah. um, that you know was diligent in his work, uh, frugal in, in how he spent his money, and and he did it over you know 20, 30 years. Yeah. You know, so it's I not sexy. Wrap but, this up. I have another yeah. call coming up at the bottom of the hour here. No, uh, this so is this is good. The last question I've got here is, what's your best piece of advice? I think my best piece of advice would be right now is find a way to get in this industry. I don't care where you are in your career. Find a way to get in this industry because mm -hmm. when we need you, we need yeah. you. We need, and guess what? We need the people. The people we need the most are the ones that did traditional energy because all. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Hydrogen, carbon capture, green chemistry. That's the same skill set as oil and gas refining and petrochemicals. It's mm -hmm. the exact same skill sets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know anything about electricity to be a hydrogen guy. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. It's a whole That's different, true. well, you need to know a little bit about electricity, but, they, but, you know, I would say, you know, find a way to get into this industry. I would also say it's such an exciting time uh, because it's, you know, how often have we gone through a transition like this? You know, mm -hmm. probably the last big energy transition we went through was from, you know, from horses to cars. Okay. And okay. That happened. Energy transitions, they always happen faster than you think. And um, and they always go in directions people don't expect. Yeah. But it's a great opportunity. I'd say for a young person, this is this is by far the best industry to be involved in because it's going to be here for a long time. Guess what? If we all go to AI, the data center is still going to need power. <laughs> yep. And they're going to need yep. plastics to build those servers. <laughs> yep, those yep, yeah. yeah. All yeah. these, they're going to need, you need stuff. And I, I'll, mm -hmm. I will close with this, you know, um, okay. an old mentor of mine at Shell once said, you know, if you don't make stuff or sell stuff, what is your purpose in the company? <laughs> mm, exactly. You know, yeah. It's all yeah. about, you know, get down to it. It's making and selling things. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And because at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of value that transfers around, but it really comes down to what's the product, you know, and how do we Absolutely. make it? And how do we sell it? Absolutely. No, I love it. I love it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. No, thanks for, you know, thanks for being on today, Ron. I appreciate you being here, giving me your candid approach on, 
on all things energy. You're talking about the hydrogen. Yeah. Um, I appreciate, you know, again, weighing in, giving us unique insights. Uh, I thank you for your time. Remember, there's an inner genius inside of all of us. It's up for you to discover it, harness it, and share it with the world. So the question always is, what's your inner genius? This is the Padua Podcast Network. Padua Podcast Network.com.